someone from the left is going to have to dress up like the Lord Almighty and be suspended from Biden's bedroom ceiling and wake him up in the middle of the night whispering, Joe, get out of the race. Like, okay, whatever Okay, KJP has a new, a new role now. <laughs> I'm Stephanie Keith. And I am Tara Manjekovic. And we are Unapologetically Outspoken. Hello and happy Wednesday. So Tara, you were out of town for a couple of days and you didn't really miss anything. (laughs) There was not a whole lot going on. All we heard on repeat was about Biden, of course, and whether or not he should stay in the race. It's like literally what every news media organization is stuck on. And I did get a lot of good clips. So there's going to be a ton of clips I'm sharing today on the podcast because I just want to highlight how absurd our media and government are being with this whole Biden situation. It's like you feel like you're in a movie. It's absolutely insane. Um, But the big story was Biden did an interview with George Stephanopoulos where his whole demeanor and the way he was talking and everything just confirmed that he's old and not fit to run. But old man Biden just doesn't see it that way. He was like in complete and utter denial to the point where even George Stephanopoulos like called him out on it and was just kind of like, you know, this is what's happening. And Biden was absolutely refusing to hear it. Um, So I'm going to play a clip. It's a lengthy clip, but it really sums up how the interview went and how Biden is not going to go easy. So listen to this. And if Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries and Nancy Pelosi come down and say, we're worried that if you stay in the race, we're going to lose the House and the Senate. How will you respond? I respect going to detail with them. I've spoken to all of them in detail, including Jim Clyburn. Every one of them. They all said I should stay in the race. Stay in the race. No one said I should leave. But if they do, well, it's like <laughs> you sure? Well, yeah, I'm sure. Look, I mean, if the Lord Almighty came out and said, "Joe, get out of the race," I get out of the race. The Lord Almighty's not coming down. I mean, these hypotheticals, George. If I mean, if but, all... but it's 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 not that hypothetical anymore. I I, I, I grant that they they have not requested the meeting, but it's been well, reported. I've met with them. I've met with a lot of these people. I've talked with them regularly. I had an hour conversation with Hakeem. I had more time with them than Jim Clyburn. I spent time with many hours off and on the last week with Chuck Schumer. It's not like I had all the governors, all the governors. I agree that the Lord Almighty is not going to come down, but if 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 you are told reliably from your allies, from your friends and supporters in the Democratic Party, in the House and the Senate, that they're concerned you're going to lose the House and the Senate if you stay in, what will you do? I'm not going to answer that question. It's not going to happen. What's your plan to turn the campaign around? Start today. How many how many people do you draw crowds like I drew today? Is I any more enthusiastic than today? I mean, I I don't think you want to play the crowd game. Donald Trump can draw big crowds. There's no question about that. He can draw a big crowd, but what does he say? Who who, does he have? I'm the guy supposedly in trouble. We raised $38 million within four days after this. We have over a million individual contributors. Individual contributors. Less less than 200 bucks. I mean, I've not seen what you're, you're proposing. You haven't seen the, the fall off in the polls. You haven't seen the reports of discontent in the Democratic Party, House Democrats, Senate Democrats. I've seen from the press. You know, I've heard from dozens of your supporters over the last few days, and a variety of views, I grant you that. Uh, but the prevailing sentiment is this. Uh, they love you. And they will be forever grateful to you for defeating Donald Trump in 2020. They think you've done a great job as president, a lot of the successes you outlined, but they are worried about you and the country, and they don't think you can win. They want you to go with grace, and they will cheer you if you do. 
What do you say to that? I say the vast majority are not where that those folks are. I don't doubt there's some folks there. Have you ever seen a group at a time when elected officials running for office aren't a little worried? Have you ever seen that? I've not. Same thing happened in 2020. Oh, I don't know, man, what's he gonna do? He may bring me down, he may. Mr. President, I've never seen a president 36% approval get reelected. I've never seen a president with 36% approval get reelected. Uh, it's oh I mean, it's almost sad if he didn't destroy our country, but he's like in total denial. Yeah. 100%. And then that, you know, like he was like mumbling the whole time, especially in the beginning. He's doing that weird like whisper grumble thing. And I feel like it's very typical of dementia patients where they'll get like that. They'll get mad and defensive and just refuse to listen to what the people around them are saying. And it's like, he's, he's absolutely refusing to gracefully bow out. So do you think they're going to like take him out? I mean, that's what I'm kind of wondering. Yeah. I'm sorry, but there's just no, there's no way. I don't know. At some point he's going to be taken out, whether it is before the election or after the election, it's going to happen. Yeah, it's like if all these people, if the elites of the party want him gone and he's refusing, they'll figure out a way for him to be gone. Like, that's just the way I'm looking at it because it's the freaking deep state. Um, but I love in the interview how he gets flat out like called out for not drawing in crowds. It's like no one can beat Trump on crowds. And why would he even say that? You know, it's like he... He's either not being coached or he can't remember on the the talking points. Like, it's just absolutely ridiculous. But I want to play one more clip from that interview because this is where Biden's asked about the future and whether or not he can handle four more years. And I think it's a great question because everyone keeps talking about whether or not he can make it to the election. But in this interview, he's actually being called out on, okay, let's say you make it to the election. Can you stay in and handle it for four more years? So let me play his response. It's about the future, not the past. They're about tomorrow, not yesterday. And the question on so many people's minds right now is, can you serve effectively for the next four years? George, I'm the guy that put NATO together, the future. No one thought I could expand it. I'm the guy that shut Putin down. No one thought it could happen. I'm the guy that put together the South Pacific initiative with August. I'm the guy that got 50 nations, out, not only in Europe, outside of Europe as well, to help Ukraine. I'm the guy that got Japanese to expand their budget. I'm the guy. So, I mean, these... Uh, George, I'm the guy that put NATO together. <laughs> what? I, I almost spit out my coffee during that part. I mean... It's like I was I played that clip and watched that part of the interview over and over again because I'm like, am I missing something? I feel like all he's doing is reinforcing how he got us into this war with Ukraine, but he's like highlighting it as a success. Like he's flat out saying like he expanded NATO. He said he created NATO. Yeah, like it's so crazy and i mean this is supposed to be to help him after that debate performance and all it did was reinforce that he has no fucking idea what's going on i mean it's it's so bad at this point i'm i'm surprised to that he even got through that interview without falling asleep number one and yeah he was <laughs> the defiance and the defensiveness That is so classic dementia. And you know what this reminded me of? It's like when elderly people are beyond the point of safely driving and their family tries to convince them not to drive anymore and like like hand over the keys, but instead they double down and they get all angry and defensive and they insist that they can still drive perfectly fine even though like they can barely back out of the driveway and like everyone holds their breath every time grandpa gets in the car because you know he's going to cause like a nine car pile up or crash into a group of pedestrians on the sidewalk. And it's like the Democrats are trying to take away his keys, but he's got this death grip on them and he's just going to keep on driving the fucking car. 
Yeah, it's exactly like that. It's it's really sad to watch, but I don't feel bad because I mean, again, he this man has destroyed our country for the past three years. Uh, so then, in addition to that interview, he calls in to his buddies at MSNBC's Morning Joe. And this interview, it sounds like they went ahead and hopped him all up on adrenaline again. So just listen to how this clip played out. Which is not going to move away from me as a happening voter. And again, I'm here for two reasons, pal. One, to rebuild the economy for hardworking middle class people, give everybody a shot. Just a straight shot. Everybody gets a fair chance. Number one. Number two, remember all this talk about how I don't have the black support. Come on, give me a break. Come with me. Why? Why? I'm getting so frustrated by, by the elite. Now, I'm not talking about you guys, but about the elite in the party who they know so much more. But if any of these guys yeah. don't think I should run against me, go ahead, announce the, announce the president. Challenge me in the convention. So she starts laughing like at him during the interview. Um, and she like kind of catches herself. Like, it seems like, so he called in on the phone. So he's probably reading a script. So of that's course. probably why he sounded like he could string a sentence together. But um, what the hell is he talking about? And then it sounds like he sets it up perfectly for someone to step up and challenge him at the DNC. Doesn't it? Like, it's kind of Yeah, strange. he was clearly reading that, by the way. It, yes. It, there's no way he wasn't reading that. And you're right. It was a phone interview. And like every time he says, pal, it just makes my <laughs> stomach turn. And like you're sitting there talking about the middle class. You're the guy who's destroying the fucking middle class. Like he is a political liability for the left. They need to get rid of him no matter how much he insists he's not dropping out of the race. Like someone from the left is going to have to dress up like the Lord Almighty and be suspended from Biden's bedroom ceiling and wake him up in the middle of the night whispering, Joe, get out of the race. Like okay, whatever KJP has a new a new role now. <laughs> Yeah, and it's like, I don't know if you saw Fox News, their broadcast from Sunday. One of the anchors, Shannon Bream, she was talking about how Fox reached out to like dozens of Biden's people to try and get someone to come on for an interview. And like nobody wanted to come on the record and defend him. And she started out the broadcast by saying, quote, before we get to our guests, I want you, the viewers at home, to know something. Our team has spent days reaching out to dozens of lawmakers and Biden advocates and allies. We've had numerous interactions with the Biden-Harris campaign, but not a single potential guest was either able or willing to join us on today's show to defend the president and his decision to stay on the ticket. So we will be having a conversation without that voice, which we have been working around the clock to avoid, end quote. So basically, nobody wants to come out and publicly support him except for, you know, the KJP, Kamala and fucking Pelosi. Right. And then I was reading in The Blaze, one of Biden's top defenders, um, Representative James Clyburn from South Carolina, he was supposed to do an interview on ABC's Face the Nation on Sunday, and he canceled that interview. <laughs> yeah. And he's the one that Biden kept you know, name dropping on mm -hmm. the George Stephanopoulos interview, like just it's it's so embarrassing. And it's like he knows he knows that they want to take him out. And he actually sent Democrats a letter, like a formal letter stating that he's staying in the race and pretty much they need to cut it out and like unify as a party because it's helping Trump. And I agree, like it's absolutely helping Trump. Mm -hmm. The Democrats are falling apart right now. So I want to read a portion from the letter. It says, quote, we had a, Demo a Democratic nomination process and the voters have spoken clearly and decisively. I received over 14 million votes, 87% of the votes cast across the entire nominating process. I have nearly 3,000 delegates, making me the presumptive nominee of our party by a wide margin. This was a process open to anyone who wanted to run. Only three people chose to challenge me. One fared so badly that he left the primaries to run as an independent. Another attacked me for being too old and was soundly defeated. The voters of the Democrat Party have voted. They've chosen me to be the nominee of the party. 
Do we now just say this process didn't matter, that the voters don't have a say? I decline to do that. I feel a deep obligation to the faith and the trust the voters of the Democratic Party have placed in me to run this year. It was their decision to make, not the press, not the pundits, not the big donors, not any selected group of individuals, no matter how well-intentioned. The voters and the voters alone decide the nominee of the Democratic Party. How can we stand for democracy in our nation if we ignore it in our own party? I cannot do that. I will not do that, end quote. Holy shit. <laughs> I agree. I agree. They had their chance to pick their candidate, and I think they should be stuck with him. Otherwise, isn't that a threat to democracy? Yeah, exactly. Except, you know, he didn't write that. Oh, absolutely not. There's no way. And like, you know, speaking of like writing, reading, speaking, I don't know if you saw the latest claim. It's that so apparently he now has to be provided with large print instructions and photos that show him the exact path, like to walk to and from the podium, wherever his events are. And I guess this was in a report published by Axios on Sunday. And it shows these large visual aids, the White House logos at the top, and then there's like a photo of the path to the podium from the backstage. And then in large print under the photo, it says, quote, walk to podium. And then the next giant cue card is a photo with large text under it again. And it says, quote, view from podium. And then one that says, quote, view from audience. And so like what there were a ton of publications talking about this. And one of of them was in the blaze they reported that an unnamed white house staffer who worked one of these recent events said quote i staffed a simple fundraiser at a private residence but they treated it like it was a nato summit with his movements it surprised me that a seasoned political pro like the president would need detailed verbal and visual instructions on how to enter and exit a room end quote um not really surprising if you spend more than five minutes watching him try to figure out where he is 90% of the time. And then the Daily Caller reported that Peter Baker, he's the New York Times chief White House correspondent, and he reportedly had to start using a translation headset to understand Biden's mumbling, even when he's standing like less than 20 feet away from Biden, because that's the only way the volume is magnified enough when Biden starts to, you know, trail off his words and get all whispery, which is so fucking creepy when he does that, by the way. And he does it all the time. All the time. I know. And it, he's either like screaming or he's whispering. There's like rarely an in-between. And it's like for the last two weeks, what? More and more attention is being called to Biden's inability to be the Democrat candidate. And the question is just when. When is he going to be removed, right? Because it has to happen. And I was reading this very interesting article in the New York Post over the weekend and it was talking about how the author of the article was saying he didn't think it's going to happen for at least two weeks because this week Biden's hosting the NATO summit in D.C. And then next week is the RNC. And so they're saying he's not going to draw until the RNC is over because that's like a victory for Republicans. We'll just highlight their convention. And this guy was predicting that it'll happen either late July or early August. And he gave three possible scenarios. And he was like, number one, Biden withdraws from the campaign and then basically endorses Kamala to stay as the VP and then bring in a new presidential candidate. Or he resigns before his term is even over. Kamala automatically becomes the president. And then nobody wants to challenge her as, you know, the incumbent, even though she would be an incumbent for what, like a couple months. And then the third option was, which we've talked about before, an open convention at the DNC where they pick new president and VP candidates. What I thought was interesting was this article pointed out how this third option could be used to create basically like a media distraction to deny Trump airtime because the Democratic race would be like front and center in the news for most of August. And then in the end, the Democrat Party would come together you know, with this nomination pairing that like unifies the party and brings all the Democrats together again. And again, obviously, these are all theories, but I firmly believe that no matter how much Biden continues to say he's not bowing out of the race, the bottom line is he is not the one in control. He's the puppet. It's not going to be his decision. And 
it's all a matter of timing, but they're not going to allow him to continue, especially not for another four fucking years if they let him get to through the election, which would be fraudulent because there's no way he could win anyway. Yeah. And I don't know why they keep acting like there's just no one, no one else there. It's like mm -hmm. RFK Jr. Like he is, he is running. Like he is actively campaigning and they act like he's not even there. They won't even acknowledge him, which is probably smart because if they did, people are going to be like, oh yeah, I'm going to vote for him instead of Biden. So I was listening to Megyn Kelly this morning and there's a, another thing that came up with Biden. So in addition to his apparent senility, it broke out over the weekend in the New York Post that a Parkinson's expert has visited the White House nine times over the past year. And like this makes complete sense because when you see how he walks and stands, like he's so stiff. We saw it throughout the debate where he was like, I mean, just like standing there and it like wouldn't budge, wasn't blinking, nothing. Um, and I knew someone with Parkinson's and their body movements were the exact same. The walking without moving your arms, your hands, like that stiff posture. Um, but what I want to know is how the fuck has no one noticed this over the past year? Like, how has there not been anyone that's thought, wow, a Parkinson's expert has been frequenting the White House. Maybe we should look into it. Like, it's unbelievable. So there's that whole thing that now I'm sure the Democrats will start playing on in addition to the fact that he has dementia. But Tara, you're going to love this one. Because one of the cringiest moments yet for KJP also happened. So I want you to listen to this clip and tell me what the fuck a big boy press conference is. After that, the president will hold a press conference. I guess a big boy press conference is what we're calling it. Um, and take some questions from y'all. This week, President Biden will speak to national labor leaders of AFL-CIO, host the NATO summit to show the unprecedented strength of our alliance, hold a press conference, a big boy press conference, according to Justin Singh from Bloomberg. A big, a big boy, boy press conference. This is like literally something I would say to my three-year-old son. Yeah, I mean, KJP is getting her ass handed to her by the press. And as much as I despise the libtard media, I give them credit for continually pushing for transparency on Biden's health issues. And it's very clear, like the White House has been trying to hide his true medical condition, whatever that may be. I am sure it's more than one thing, but they've been fucking hiding it. And KJP is claiming that this is a personal attack. So I want to play this clip from Monday what we do and we understand that freedom of the press we respect the freedom of the press you heard me talk about this last week we i appreciate the back and forth that we all have it is i try to respect you and i hope you try to respect me and we literally do everything that we can my team does everything that we can to make sure we get the answers to you that's what we do and sometimes we disagree sometimes we are not in agreement but you know what? That's democracy. That is what is important to have that healthy back and forth. And so to say that I'm holding information or allude to anything else is not unfair. It's really, really unfair. I think people who are watching and have been watching this briefing for this past week could say that we are doing our best in this briefing to provide the information that we have. And I will admit, I will be the first one to admit, sometimes I get it wrong. At least I admit that. At least I admit that. And sometimes I don't have the information. And I will always, always admit that. But I do take offense to what was just happening at the beginning of this briefing. It's not okay. We are seeking clarity. I understand that. And uh, I think what we're trying to say is when a name is in a public record on a waves form, yeah. that it is in the public domain. Yeah. The president could authorize that his medical records or additional medical information uh, could be made public because uh, he could waive HIPAA, he could do those things. Yeah. Um, and if he chooses to do that, we would like to know more. And part of the reason we are pressing here is that we are not clear on what has happened. And therefore, the American people who, to whom we report don't have a sense of it. So that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. Um, and so personal attacks is not okay. 
and and so we want to have a talk to very very clear here <laughs> so the question is one question is after um, a debate that drew days and days and days of scrutiny why hasn't the president had an in-person physical check-in maybe blood work maybe other things yeah. because when he said he was seen i certainly thought he had been physically seen yeah. not a phone check -in. No. so as and that's part of what we're saying about yeah. how information comes out in waves and then we may have a different impression so and i totally understand that his presidency yeah. for 10 days and he could submit to another exam a full exam partial exam whatever he can waive his right to make things public none of us are asking about the military members who might be seeing a physician here. None of us. We are only asking about yeah. the president's well-being. Understood. And so that's why we want to understand. When you see yeah. on the public records that a physician with his specialty has come to the White House, gone to the residence clinic, and met with the president's physician, we feel like there is more to be said there, and that's what we're asking. Uh, and I understand that, Kelly O, and you know I respect you wholeheartedly, and I've known you for some time. We want to be also, because we are particular, we are talking about someone whose name who is out there, and I understand. I get it. It's in the law. I get that. It's in the law. The we want to we want to respect that person and give them the measure of privacy that they deserve. The moment I say anything about any specialist, it becomes a thing from this podium. So what I can share, and this is what I can share, he has seen a neurologist three times. Three times, not more, not we're here, not more than that, not more than that. He's seen a neurologist three times. Three times, Stephanie. It's not okay. You know, let me be clear. Let me be clear, but then never be clear and transparent, never tell you anything. <laughs> yeah, good for them for, you know, calling her out. Um, it's about damn time they start doing that. But yeah, like needless to say, the left is freaking out. And it's all anyone's talking about. So again, I just want to point out that they lied and gaslit the rest of us for the past three years about Biden being unfit. And now they're trying to act like it's a new thing. And it's just, it's so aggravating. So what are they doing now? Well, now they're going hard on social media, talking about Trump's Project 2025 and how it's going to be like The Handmaid's Tale. So finally, Trump and his team started debunking all of these things. So he debunked the federal ban on abortion during the debate. And then this past week, he made it crystal clear with his Truth Social post saying, quote, I know nothing about Project 2025. I have no idea who is behind it. I disagree with some of the things they're saying, and some of the things they're saying are absolutely ridiculous and abysmal. Anything they do, I wish them luck, but I have nothing to do with them, end quote. So there goes that attack on, on him. So I don't know what they're going to do next, but I think he's been handling this really well. He's laying low. He's staying quiet when he could be going full force attacking Biden. He's being very, you know, calm and debunking all of these things that they're saying about him. So I, I think he's doing well. I, I do, however, think that's not accurate. I think he knows about Project 2025. I think he knows exactly who's behind it. But that being said, he has made it clear from the beginning. Let me be clear. Oh, my God. I sound like KJP. <laughs> he has made it clear, though, that that's not his agenda. He has his own agenda. And while some components of it may be similar to Project 2025, it's nowhere near as conservatively extreme. So for him to distance himself from it, I think is entirely appropriate. But to say he knows nothing about it, I don't think that was the right thing to say because I think he does know what it is. Yeah. Well, and where are all the journalists? You know, they keep talking about Project 2025. None of them have mentioned Project 47. Right. There's a reason because it sounds good and reasonable. And it's like they're not doing their job. They're just going off of something that they know is false to try to to spin it in their favor. But enough about our election. Let's talk about the elections in Europe. What's going yeah. on? Yeah. Okay. So 
France had their second round of snap elections this past Sunday, and we talked about this last Friday. The French President Macron, he made this last-ditch effort to bring like the socialist and communist coalition of left-wing parties together with his centrist party in this like very sneaky and calculated way last week, and basically was convincing both sides to work together. They withdrew over 200 candidates from both parties out of the race so that only their strongest candidates remained as the opposition for the conservative candidates so that they could pull voters away from the National Rally Party candidates and try to prevent the right from gaining votes because the right was gaining a lot of traction and they had gotten the most votes in the first round of the election process. And so the plan worked. And Macron managed to keep the right from gaining power this past Sunday. But France is now in total upheaval. And it's a political shit show. Because even though the left and the center work together to defeat the right, the bottom line is they're still opposing parties. And now the president, what he's done is he's helped the left wing coalition gain a lot more power. And that really doesn't serve him well either because the left-wing party is against him. And so initially, he made this move to disband parliament and hold these snap elections to create a new cabinet under the guise of thinking it was going to help his party. But what it did instead was win the socialist and communist coalition more seats in parliament and less seats for his own party. So was this really a smart move? Because now he's aligned himself with a party that he has openly said is just as dangerous as the conservatives. And he's saying that he thinks he can control the left and bring them together with his party and come to a compromise. But that's exactly what President Hindenburg thought in the 1930s when Germany was in turmoil and the Nazi party gained a bunch of seats in government. And what happened? They eventually became the largest political party in the Reichstag, and Hitler was made chancellor because the existing government thought that that's how they would be able to control him. But instead, that's how he rose to power. And so it seems to me like this is the start of the same type of thing with the same possibility of happening, except it's an opposite political narrative, where instead of being about nationalism and getting rid of everyone who isn't French, it's the complete opposite because the left-wing party in France wants to do just that. They want to destroy French French culture. They're very outspoken about it. They are completely in support of these massive like immigration policies that are way worse than ours in the US. They want insane taxes. Like I've heard up to 90% of taxes, things that do nothing to benefit the people of France. And just from a common sense perspective, now the French government is just going to be even more ineffective. Like more ineffective than our own fucked up clown show Congress. Because, you know, we have a right-leaning House and a left-leaning Senate, and half the time nothing gets accomplished, right? Well, now France has three major parties in power, and none of them have a clear majority of seats, unless the center continues to cave to the left. Like, nothing is going to get accomplished. And the results of this election process are already wreaking havoc in France almost immediately, the left's largest force in the coalition. It's called La France Insurmise or La Fran- France Unbowed. And they're calling for the president to resign and saying that they won't be compromising on what they want. During a speech, the leader of this party said, quote, the president must bow and admit this defeat without trying to circumvent it. No subterfuge arrangement or combination will be acceptable, end quote. And then on Monday, the current French prime minister, Gabriel Attal, he handed his resignation into President Macron, who rejected it and said that he has to stay in power to basically reassure the public that France's government is stable. And meanwhile, more riots broke out in Paris on Sunday after the results of this second election were announced, except this time, instead of rioting in protest because the right gained power, they were rioting in celebration of the left's victory. And it's like, it reminded me of when people in LA riot when the Lakers win a game, like its behavior, I don't understand and never will. But tens of thousands of protesters flooded the streets. An estimated 30,000 riot police were deployed throughout the country, over 5,000 riot police in Paris alone. There's video footage showing rioters throwing fireworks and smoke grenades at officers. Again, the same thing they did last Sunday, destroying government property, historical monuments, lighting shit on fire. 
So France is in trouble. And I want to point out that this is just giving us a clear example and a precedent for what could possibly happen in the United States. And so, as usual, I want to play a clip from Real AF because Andy Frisell is talking about how this is all on track with the global agenda for a one world government. It's kind of a long clip, but it's a good one. Now, put this in Americans' terms. This would be like a month out from the election a new independent communist, some other third party comes in the election, right? And starts running, gains all of the steam out of nowhere. From the migrants. From the migrants, right? A, a voice of the people from that side. <clears throat> the election gets called, they get, you know, a decent chunk, 25% of the vote. And they say, oh, we'll just give it to the other side. And that's how they automatically win. That's bullshit. It's complete bullshit, but that's exactly what they did there. It's exactly what they did. Well. French people better figure it out, dude, because these people ain't playing games. And you saying, I can't believe they did this. They're doing it. They're doing it, bro. And they intend to do it all the way. And they will remove the native populations to create a one race, world race, world government. That is what they intend to do. They intend to eliminate the native populations of all of these places where all of these migrants are being imported into. And they're wanting to do so to create a unified race that has no nationalist pride and that is okay with a one world government. That's, that's the goal here and it's happening. And, uh, you know, it's weird that people don't care or think that it's going to somehow stop. Nobody's coming to stop this. Nobody's coming to stop this from happening. It's your citizens that need to stop this from happening. French, People need to wake the fuck up and realize that if they don't stand up now, they're going to be fucking gone forever. That's exactly what's going on here. Mm -hmm. So they're handing the country over to fucking third world migrants and saying French people don't have a right to exist in their own country. And they're going to do the same thing here in America. That's why they're pumping so many migrants into our system. They're, they're, they, are, they are just at the beginning of the migrant surge mm -hmm. if biden stays in power it's going to get a hundred times worse and in four years we'll be there yeah did you see that uh there was this this bill that they they've been trying to get passed called the safe act which like you know basically like <clears throat> it kind of reassure like re reinsures the fact that no non-american citizen can vote in our federal elections yeah yeah biden just said no i'm not even going to look at it of course why would he he's like oh well we already have laws in place to protect that Okay, well, why would he? Why why not just look, dude, them? Here's the problem. They're gonna cheat their asses off. No, listen, man. These people, the problem is us. The problem is the people. The problem is the people believing that these people are not serious in their goals and that someone is going to walk away from this and that they're just gonna say, Oh, you know what? It's politics as usual. Let us go away. That is not what's going to happen. It's not gonna happen there. It's not gonna happen here. I'm actually glad this happened because if Americans are paying attention, they, they can get a really good understanding of what's going to happen here, which is anything required to stay in power, okay? And they just blatantly acted Contrary to the interests of the native population of that country and said, hey, French people, fuck you. We're taking this bitch and you're not going to do anything about it. And that's what they're trying to do here. That's what they've already done in England. That's what they're doing everywhere. And everybody thinks that someone's coming along to stop it. These people need to rise the fuck up and stop this. Real talk. Because they're at a point now where if they don't, they will face severe violence, economic turmoil, and the ruining of lives, and probably eventually their own death based upon removing these people who are pro a serious problem, according to the fucking leader of France now. Mm -hmm. Think, imagine the leader of France saying native-born French people are a serious problem. That is the same thing they say here when they say patriotic Americans are a threat. You know, when they did J6 and they tried to make everybody afraid of what, you know, the patriotic American after for 230 years, they were praised as the lifeblood of America and brought up to be the lifeblood of America. Now, all of a sudden, we are on some sort of domestic terror list. This is the point. 
And it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until people wake the fuck up. And I highly anticipate the similar situation happening here. Agreed. Agreed. And he makes a great point. Like this is foreshadowing what's going to happen here because France, really all of Europe is a step ahead because they've had open borders a lot longer than we have. And so we're letting all these people in right now. That's going to be next where they start to get into political power. And, yep. it, you know, it's it's scary. And like speaking of the elections, um, and just what's happening here, um, it's already taking place. You have Elon Musk that retweeted uh, this post that had a photo of a form from Arizona's AHCCS Medicaid office. And it said, the, the form says, quote, if you do not submit proof of citizenship and we cannot acquire proof of citizenship from the Arizona Motor Vehicle Division or the Statewide Voter Registration Database, you will receive a federal only ballot, which has only federal races and no state, county or local races and initiatives slash referendums. So Elon Musk posts that and comments, Arizona requires proof of citizenship in state elections, but explicitly does not for federal elections. This is messed up. And it is like it is so bad. Um, and Arizona is a swing state. So like. What I don't understand is there is proof right there. They always say there's no proof of election interference. This is proof of blatant election interference. Like, it's driving me crazy. How are they getting away with this shit? And then another thing that Elon Musk retweeted that Andy had mentioned in that clip is a post uh, from Speaker Mike Johnson, which said, quote, it should alarm every American citizen that the sitting president of the United States, who has opened our borders to over nine million illegals, just announced that he would veto our bill to prevent non-citizens from voting, end quote. Now, I always thought, Tara, that like if a leader of a country willingly lets that country be invaded, uh, that's the very definition of treason. And I, I looked up the actual dictionary definition of tre treason, and it reads, the crime of betraying one's country, especially by attempting to kill the sovereign or overthrow the government. How this is tr this is treason. Biden is treasonous. Like maybe that's how they can get him out of the race, because clearly he's he's treasonous. But that's the trend that's going on all over the world. And that's the thing with this whole global push to create one identity and so people like get rid of nationalism and they've been trying to do that here for a long time and speaking of the the save act like i think this week is when congress is voting on the save act and so like mike johnson and the republicans have been pushing very hard for it um like you said dj mentioned it in that clip I just played, but we talked about it in a previous episode a week or two ago. And it's a House-led bill. It's the Safeguard American Voter Eligibility Act. And if it gets passed, what it will do is amend the National Voter Registration Act of 1993 to require proof of citizenship before registering to vote. And so obviously the White House and the left are totally opposed to it because it defies the narrative. And I think the vote might actually be happening later today. Um, it's either supposed to happen Tuesday or Wednesday. But even if it does pass in the House, the left controls the Senate. So the bill's not going to go anywhere. I mean, it's just dead in the water, right? And the White House did put out a statement and they said, quote, it's already illegal for non-citizens to vote in federal elections. It is a federal crime and punishable by prison and fines. The alleged justification for this bill is based on easily proven falsehoods. States already have effective safeguards in place to verify voters' eligibility and maintain the accuracy of voter rolls. This bill would do nothing to safeguard our elections, but it would make it much harder for all eligible Americans to register to vote and increase the risk that eligible voters are purged from voter rolls. The evidence is clear that the current laws prevent non-citizen voting are working as intended. It is extraordinarily rare for non-citizens to break the law by voting in federal elections, end quote. Now, I do want to point out that 
some Democrat leaders are pushing this by saying, oh, this this bill is going to make it so that you can't use a driver's license to vote or a real ID to vote. You have to use your passport, which is bullshit. That's not what's in this bill. It just requires proof of citizenship and ID. So if you're a citizen and you have a fucking driver's license, you should already be registered anyway. And I do also think it was interesting. The Washington Examiner, they brought up this fraud database analysis that was done by the Heritage Foundation, which is this very conservative organization. We talk about them all the time. But I guess they sampled over a million, I'm sorry, a billion ballots, and they only found like 100 cases of non-citizen voting between 2002 and 2022. And so I am 100% in support of this bill. But I think the real problem that we need to be focusing on right now is election fraud with how we vote, not with who can vote, because it's not going to change anything for this upcoming election in a few months. The focus needs to be on securing election integrity, because we already know election fraud is going to be rampant again this year. And it's just a matter of how much and how they're going to do it. And so I want to play one last clip from this same episode of Real AF because Andy makes a very interesting and valid point about getting out and voting despite knowing that election fraud is going to take place. Listen, you don't have your family farm or your family property or your grandpa's land that's been in the family for 150 years. That's going to be fucking gone. OK, because they're going to do exactly what they're doing in Canada and exactly what they're doing in the Netherlands, which is increasing the prices of all of the farming chemicals, all of the costs of living fuel. They're taxing people differently. They're making it so people who live in ag areas cannot fucking produce food. If you cannot produce food, you cannot produce money to pay for the farm. If you cannot produce money to pay for the farm. And well, we own the farm. It doesn't matter. Okay, well, how are you going to pay the taxes on the farm? You see what I'm saying? And then all of a sudden they get all the land back. And that's how communism operates. And communism is targeting right now the rural community and the rural community is completely oblivious to it. They're completely oblivious. How, how is there 250,000 registered hunters in Missouri that are not registered to vote? How is there 200,000 people in fucking Kansas that are registered hunters. How How is that? Yeah, that's wild. You know, people have to get to, they, you guys have to come to an understanding, like we have a duty to vote the way that we want to vote. And you may believe that the elections are compromised. I do as well, but I'm still going to vote and I'm still going to try to get everybody else to vote because I realize that if they steal and everybody votes, it's going to be hard for them to actually prove they didn't steal, which allows for us to at least have a card to play. OK, so like I don't want to hear this shit from all you dumb fucks about how voting doesn't change anything or this or that. OK, maybe you're right. But the point is, are you going to ride up in your fucking tank and start shooting people? No, we need motherfuckers to vote so we can figure out what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Oh, they stole the election. Well, did you vote? No, well, they didn't steal. Yeah, the election. That, they didn't steal it. They just fucking won. That's right. <laughs> and that's why, all, look at bro, it. and all these people keep saying that. And it's yeah. like, dude. It's almost like I think it's bots on the internet trying to discourage people from voting. I think that's real. Yeah. I think that's a lot of that too, man. Dude, not only should you vote, you should be bringing four or five people that you know weren't going to vote to vote with you. You should make a day out of it. Make a caravan out of it. Get them together. Get some fucking cold beers. Go vote. Then go drink beer. Right. Like, fuck, dude, take a day off. Who cares? But it's, it's important shit. And all of you guys who keep going around on the internet saying your vote's worthless. Okay. Well, what are you going to do? You see what I'm saying? They want you to think you're they're, worthless. They're not doing shit. No, that's what they want you to think. They want you to think you're and worthless. And if, if everybody votes and they still steal, what do you think's going to happen? There will be a fucking revolt. Mm -hmm. Okay. So go fucking vote. You know how I often like fuck up when I'm trying to play a clip and I don't start it at the right time? Well, this was one of those because in the beginning, what he was talking about was how people like a lot of Americans are saying like they're just not voting. They're just not going to vote at all. And then you have all of like, you know, a lot of the hardcore gun rights people that are like, well, fuck it. You know what? I've got my guns. Let them come and take it. Right. 
And he was saying like, it's not going to be that way. They're not going to come knock on your door and and take away your guns. They're going to tax the fuck out of you. They're going to make it so that you cannot support yourself. And eventually you're not going to be able to, you know, pay for your home. And even if you own your home, you're not going to be able to pay the taxes. And they're just going to come in and take your property because that's how communism works. And so I agree 100% because I listen to so many people saying, well, fuck it, I'm just not going to vote. And like, we already know that there's going to be fraud. So what's the point in voting? And yes, there is going to be fraud. Like I would bet my life on that, but I'm still going to fucking vote. You know, I'm going to absentee vote from out of the country, but I'm still going to fucking vote. And everybody needs to get out there and do the same. Well, and that's the thing, like being from Illinois, people said that all the time. There were a ton of people that were um, right leaning that were like, well, I'm not going to vote because it's a blue state because of Cook County, it's always going to be blue. And so it's like, well, yeah, that's why, because you aren't going and voting if enough people are fed up. And I think this is one of those elections. And if you look, I saw someone post this on TikTok. It was like the map of the United States over the last hundred years. And it does flip. It does go from like mostly red to mostly blue to a, a 50-50 mix to then blue again and then red, red again. There is like a cycle. So it can change, but it's not going to change if everyone just assumes, well, it's it's just going to be Democrat because I live in Illinois or I live in California or I live in New York. Like now is the time it would change. I think people are fed up enough where if everyone actually went out there and voted, it could flip these states. We did it in Florida. Yeah. You can do it in a lot of other states as well. So I think it's a great point. Um, and it, everyone just has to do it. Like there's, this isn't like, a not, you know, it's a non-negotiable. There's yeah. too much on the line. So we'll keep everyone posted on what's going on with Biden and whether or not he's in the race, out of the race, whatever. And also Trump is supposed to announce his VP pick over the next week. So hopefully we'll have that for you. If not Friday, definitely it should be out by Monday. So stay tuned. We'll keep you posted. And thanks for tuning in. If you're sick of all the crazy shit going on in our country and you want to express your support and patriotism for the show, head on over to our Etsy store at UO Patriot Chicks and check out our new stickers. The link can also be found on our website. If you love the show and you want exclusive episodes, support the podcast and join the conversation by becoming a member of our Patreon community. We'll be posting weekly member-only podcast episodes and content that isn't available on the weekly podcast. Every Patreon member will also get a free, unapologetically outspoken sticker and updates about our new sticker release before they're made public. And be sure to follow us on TikTok at unapologetically outspoken. And if you haven't done so already, please rate and review the podcast. The more you support us, the more people we can reach. So help us spread the word.